All right, Ed, we're back with part five, and here we are going to use OpenSSL to inspect some certificates that are not valid. There's no not valid certs on the internet. Ed, what are you, what are you talking about, man? If, if only. I would love to live in that world, but regrettably, I live in this world. <laughs> um, cool, yeah. So we're going to use sort of the same commands we used uh, in part four to take a look at certificates that we know are bad. Now, the, the idea here is... is Doing SSL, working with SSL, you're going to end up running into a bunch of SSL errors. And what we're going to do is kind of show you a few known errors so that you know what to look for to validate those errors using OpenSSL. Yeah. And so we're going to start off in the exact same directory we were at the end of part five. All we did in part, sorry, at the end of part four, all we did in part four is we downloaded the certificates for ethancbanks.com and google.com. And we used an OpenSSL command to take a look at the content. Uh, we downloaded that certificate using another OpenSSL command, the S client utility, and we're going to make use of both of those in this section. I want to introduce you to a really, really neat website called badssl.com. The makers of badssl.com have set up a bunch of websites with known problematic SSL certificates that you can use for testing and displaying and showing what it would look like when you go to, say, a uh, site with an untrusted root certificate. So I'm going to click on this site, and in theory, Chrome should give me an error, which it looks like Chrome did catch it. Chrome's like, hey, wait a minute, something's going on. We don't trust this site for some reason or another. Now, I could click through this if I wanted to, right? That would be unsafe if, if it was found in, in the real world. But since this was the expected behavior, we are happy. You know, like Good work, Chrome, for detecting this. As a side note, we won't be able to show it to you on the screen. But it's fun to actually see which one of these that are bad that Chrome catches, but then also test that against Chrome, say, on your mobile phone or on different browsers to see what sort of security checks the different browsers are doing. Um, it's less unanimous than you might. Yes, it's shocking that the, yeah. the different behaviors, you'd assume basically all the browsers would follow the same rules and behave the same way when they're dealing with an invalid certificate, and they don't necessarily. You can't assume that because their cert's invalid for some reason that uh, everybody handles it in the same way. They don't. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So the badassell.com has has a bunch of them and we're not gonna look at all of them. That would take take way too long. So I'm just gonna pick out a few uh, that, that seem the most relevant and, and that we would see kind of the most often if you are troubleshooting a cell you know, in, in the real world or, or whatever the case. So we're gonna start with kind of a pretty simple one. This guy right here, this expired certificate. So if I click on this guy, uh, you'll see Chrome errors out, and that's good. We, we want that to happen. We want Chrome to tell me, hey, something's going on. In fact, it even gave us a, oh, that's cool. It showed me the uh, certificate itself. Uh, it even showed us the, uh, let me zoom in, even showed us the uh, certificate error that it gave you. And it said, hey, the, the date's invalid. So let's take a look. You know, If you're in a situation where you're like, no, I, I thought I installed the new certificate. You know, This shouldn't be happening. Maybe it's because it's something is cached. Maybe something on the way is giving us an older certificate. Let's actually recreate the connection to expire.badssl.com ourselves and actually verify this using OpenSSL. So we'll go back to the terminal and I'll use the same command we did we used before in part four. So I'll do OpenSSL S client and I'll say go ahead and connect connect to a particular website. In this case, we're just going to paste expire.badssl.com. We are going to connect to it on port 443. If I hit enter, it'll do the SSL connection. And if I scroll up, you'll see this is the actual certificate that was presented by the host, expiredssl.com. Um, I can simply put that, so expired at sl.com. So this is just me copying and pasting that into a text file using Vim. And now I have this text file, which simply matches the certificate that we just downloaded using the OpenSL utility. And then I'll use the same X509 inspection utility that we've used in part four and three and two of this series. I'll feed in the certificate file, I'll ask for no out, and I'll ask for the text. And I'll actually spell text correctly. Uh, and then I'll scroll all the way up and we can see that these are the validity dates in the certificate that was just presented to me. And again, uh, it didn't do any red flags. It didn't even color code it. It's just, right. yeah, no, that's not, not valid. And it's up to us as the engineers to be reading right. this and know what we're looking at. Right. Uh, when you're using these troubleshooting tools, right, it's, 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 it's meant to show you what is actually happening and not necessarily what a user, a user who isn't expected to understand SSL uh, should be expected to do, right? So you want your users to, to see something like this, something like, uh oh, right. this is bad. I'm not going to do anything, right? Uh, but you as the engineer, you as the admin, you as the system admin, 
uh, should be able to look into the uh, the background to see what's actually happening. And that's oh, what if only our users paid attention to the errors instead of no, I want to get to the site. I must be fine. Click OK, OK, OK until they get if, the site to load. <laughs> if only indeed. Now I will pull up the cheat sheet for this next sentence. So this is the OpenSL cheat sheet, just a cheat sheet I put together with a bunch of commands you could use to inspect certificates, keys, and whatnot. And where I want to draw your attention to is this section right in here. So we've been using this command where we feed in a certificate and we ask for no base64 encoded output uh, and we ask for the text output instead. Uh, but you can actually extract specific pieces of information from a certificate and I'll show that to you. So you see it over here, you can ask for the dates directly. So if I use the exact same command that I used before, except instead of asking for dash text, I use dash dates. Uh, I can extract the validity dates directly. Mm -hmm. So if I want to create some sort of automated testing or automated checking of are we in range or whatever, I would use probably something like this rather than parsing through the whole dash text output. Also have start date and end, oops, without the underscore. Start date and end date as, uh, as options as well. If you're writing any sort of automation, that'll, that'll do this. Those are more exact, if you will. Come to think of it, I think we might have shown this in part two, because I think we use that to extract the modules. Cool. Well, so that's the validity dates. That's how you would check to see what's happening on the wire. We'll go back to badssl.com, uh, and let's take a look at this guy next, wrong host. So if I click on this guy, obviously Chrome is going to be like, hey, this is not good. This is, you know, something's going wrong, which is good. That's what we want. Uh, if I pull up wronghost.com, and I take a look doing the exact same thing we did before. So again, I'll do open SSL, S client, connect, and then I'll type in the domain we're checking and then port 443. I could hit enter here and it'll do its thing. The other thing I can do, obviously I could copy and paste the certificate as we have before. Uh, but the other option I have is to simply redirect this to a particular file. So let's go ahead and call the file wrong host bad SSL dash cert, mm -hmm. that'll create, that'll create this file. And the content of this file, if we take a look at it, includes essentially the same output that we had at the end of the OpenSL command itself. But the cool thing is all this extra stuff, OpenSL knows to ignore it and just focus on the stuff that's inside begin certificate through end certificate even though there's a bunch of extra stuff in this particular file. I can take a look at this file directly, open SO, x509, using the x509 utility, I'll feed in wrong host, I'll do no out, and just for kicks, we'll look at the dates. Uh, and you can see that it does, it is able to look at the certificate file with all the extra stuff. Now, you know, whether a load balancer will let you install that file or a web server will let you install that file, probably not, who knows. Uh, but OpenSL is smart enough to at least parse the output of that file. In our case though, what we cared about is the subject. And if we take a look, the subject of this particular field had a common name of star.badssl.com. Whereas when as we, you were saying in the previous part, we've got right. a second, uh, another subdomain, you know, wrong right. is uh, wrong dot is at that higher domain level. And so this right. wildcard cert doesn't cover it. It would cover host.badssl.com, but not wrong.host.badssl.com. Right. Exactly. Exactly, 100%. So there's an extra unknown subdomain. Now, to be extra thorough, the other place we'd also want to check to see is the subject alternative name section. Also in the X509 certificate, you can see that there's a way to extract just the subject alternative name from a certificate. And so I will do that next. Open. So X509, I'll feed in the certificate itself. I'll do no out. And I'll say I'm looking for the extension sub subject alt name. And this is telling me that these are the other domains that this particular certificate will also protect. And you can see in both cases, neither of these match wrong.host.badssl.com. If we did this, for instance, to the Google certificate that we looked at in part four, we'll see we'll get a lot more information because sure, they have yeah. a huge sand, sand entry. Sidebar question, Ed, for you. Yeah. Well, um, you know, a lot of Unix commands will allow you to output data in JSON format or some kind of a structured data format. Does OpenSSL play that, that way? Goodness, do they have, um, 
I wouldn't be able to answer that directly. I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, that's fine. It's just a just curious. That's a thing that comes up for people that deal with programming. And yeah. you know, sometimes that's a nice cheat if you can call out to shell and use a command and get the data uh, and absorb it as JSON, it's a little easier to work with. Uh, and it's 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 not so common that like you would expect every command to have it, but I see it pop up from time to time. It's like, oh, that's interesting. Do a quick little search just to see if JSON appears. It doesn't look like it appears in the manual file, so I'm, I'm gonna guess no. But I vaguely remember seeing something like that in OpenSL. So it's possible, it's possible the X509 utility doesn't, but maybe one of the other utilities does. Um, yeah, that's a good question though, since the world is going towards uh, automation and, and everything. So we'll go back to badssl.com. We did wrong host. So let's take a look at self-sign. So self-sign actually happens fairly often. Um, this is when the certificate you're using is signed by itself. Uh, and the official definition of a self-sign certificate is when the subject field matches the issuer field exactly. So in part four, we looked at Google certificate and we saw that Google CA created google.com certificates. Well, that's technically not self-signed, even though it's the same entity, the subject and issuer fields don't match, therefore it's not a self-signed certificate. In fact, we can, since we just had it right here, we can do dash subject dash issuer, and we can see that the subject field and the issuer field don't match exactly, therefore it's not self-signed. The issue here, you know, with self-signed is that you have issued a certificate not from a, a, a recognized certificate authority. You signed it yourself and said, you can trust me, it's all good. Right. So we've we've still got encryption that's going on there between client and server using that self-signed certificate, but not um, we, we don't have that, that encryption coming from an uh, authoritative source, if you will, not necessarily a trustworthy source. So right. you don't know who you're talking to necessarily is the issue. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And in lesson one and two, we, we generated a bunch of self-signed certificates. So it's just it's just a few commands you type into a Linux terminal to generate a, a real fully operational certificate, but it is self-signed. So you can use that certificate wherever you want, uh, but the issue is that it isn't blessed by a publicly trusted CA. So we will continue with where we are. I'm gonna do an SSL connection to uh, selfsigned.badssl.com on port 443. So I already told you how you can redirect that to a file and then use the x509 command on the file itself. You also have another option you can do. Now, uh, I'm going to step my way through it. So if I do the connection, everything will work as expected. To close this connection, I would use capital Q or capital all capital letters quit. But what I can also do is simply echo Q to this command. That'll instantly quit, quit the connection. So pretty cool. So that's what I just typed right there. And then what I can also do is redirect that to a file, which is kind of what I showed you the last time, but I can also redirect that directly to OpenSSL uh, X509. And then from there, I'm not gonna specify in because it's gonna come from, from the, the piping of the commands. Uh, I will say no out, and just for kicks, I'll show you the validity dates and this step through. This is just the, the connection meta details, if you will, uh, but you'll see right in here, it was able to parse the dates from this connection. Now, if you're watching this and your Linux foo uh, is not strong, uh, all that's happening here is we're, we're sending the output from one command line command directly into the next command and then chaining them together with those vertical right. bars. Very common technique you'll see in, in Linux if this looks foreign to you. Absolutely. So we're sending the queue to quit this command, and then we're sending the output of this command to the uh, X509 interpreter to extract the subject and issuer in this case. So if I hit enter, oops, I didn't need to hit enter twice. You'll see that this is the actual result. And so the Linux, I think I'll, I'm gonna get a lot of flack from the Linux folks amongst me. We get annoyed that I didn't mention. I can also get rid of the, uh, yeah, I can get rid of all of this extra text from the command by redirecting the two, I'm not a Linux, admin. So I don't remember exactly what the two thing, but it like redirects the error error messages or something like that. Sorry for you Linux folks, correct me in the comments if, if you need to. In any case, in one line, I was able to very quickly extract what is the subject and issuer that occur that, that I see in the certificate when browsing to selfsign.batasl.com on port 443. And you and can prove see over your here, point that the subject and the issuer are in fact identical. Exactly. 
one more. Uh, and oddly, this one actually just came up on Twitter today. Somebody else mentioned it and, and tweeted at me. Uh, so we're going to do that one. So first, I'll show it to you in a browser. So we'll go to badssl.com again, and we'll scroll down in here for these two over here called 1,000 cents. Now notice they show up green, which is to say they're perfectly valid, signed by a CA, all that fun stuff. Uh, but if you want to test, say, how you receive large pieces of information from a web server, here is a certificate that includes 1,000 SAN names. Now, in the case of this particular certificate, it hasn't been renewed, so you're getting the uh, cert date invalid. But if you take a look at the actual certificate, it's pretty big. There's there's a lot going on. It's substantial, in that certificate. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what we are going to do is do the exact same thing we just did. So open SL, S client. I'm going to connect to, uh, what was the domain? To thousandsands.batsl.com on port 43. I'll redirect the stuff we don't care about to dev null, and I'll redirect the stuff we do care about to thousandsands.batsl.com. Sure. It'll take a second. If I go through it, I now have this file. Uh, and if I do a word count on that file, we can see that that file includes a thousand words and what is that, 40,000 40, characters. Mm -hmm. uh, as compared to Google certificate, which by no means was small, only had 4,000 characters. If I do an open SSL X509 for the thousand fans certificate, I do a no out and I do a slash text and I scroll up. We can see that there happens to be a very long set of fields in this particular extension, the subject alternative name. It is a bunch of these, a thousand of these. While more sans one through 1000. Yeah. <laughs> Credit to the bad SSL folks for having a, a sense of humor. I appreciate that. So that is the bad SSL website. Really cool website. Uh, I got to give them credit. Like it's helped a lot in the, in the teaching and understanding and helping and communicating to people how SSL works and, and, and errors and things you can watch out for. Fun to kind of play around with, with some of the stuff in here. The issue though, <clears throat> is everything we just did is essentially looking at troubleshooting uh, errors that might occur on the server side. So the server sent me a certificate that is self-signed. The server sent me a certificate that is uh, expired. The server sent me a certificate with you know, 10,000 SAN entries or whatever the case. So hopefully some of those commands we showed you uh, gave you some insight on, on how to go about it when the server is making mistakes. The other side of the SSL negotiation though is the client. And what we're gonna be doing next in part six is showing you some troubleshooting options you have to troubleshoot what's happening if the client is having some issues. Thank you.